we are wrapping up this series. It's been a fun series. I hope you've walked away from these commandments going, oh my goodness, these are far different than I thought. I, I thought that this was just going to be a series of rules and I'm going to have to stick on my refrigerator and you know what, if, if I do well, then God loves me. But I hope you've discovered that that's not what the Ten Commandments are. They are a way for us to discover God's heart. And so in this journey of these Ten Commandments, you've been able to discover who is God and what is his heart towards you, because it is a good heart, and God wants to connect with you, and he's given us these, these commandments as a way for us to discover him. And also these commandments are a way for us to walk as people. You wonder who you should be, how you should live, how you should bring hope to the world around you, what your life should look like. Well, these are some great ways to be able to live the life of Christ. And so this journey through the Ten Commandments has been challenging. It's been good. It's been great. I've enjoyed it. Um, And that's where we're going. So this morning, we're going to do something a little different. We've had nine weeks to cover Ten Commandments, and if you're a math major, you understand that that's not going to work out. So what I need to do today is something a little different. I'm going to cover two commandments. We're going to jump back to number three. We skipped it. And then I'm going to combine it with number nine. And I know you're thinking, oh my gosh, Jim, with two commandments, we're going to be here for seven hours today. No, uh, I'm going to squeeze it all in, I promise. uh, And we're going to travel through it. So we're not going to be able to go too deep on each, but we're going to cover them in a way that I think is going to be challenging to us. So let's just cut to the chase and dive right in. The third commandment is one that uh, you have, I'm sure, had quoted to you by your mama. And it was this one. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Now, when I was growing up, uh, whenever we said anything inappropriate in the house, no matter what it was, uh, my mom reached over and she grabbed the what? (laughs) Some of you mamas are in the house today, yeah. She'd grab the soap, whatever it was, ivory dial, lava, which I hated because it had pumice in it. Oh my gosh, I almost lost half my... The things that make you taste taste buds in my mouth. And she would come up, you, you come here. And she would take that soap and she would make us bite it. Uh, and that was her way of saying, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Now, half the time I didn't say anything that had anything to do with God. But if it was inappropriate, she was quoting this verse to us while she did it. I had a friend that, uh, that had the same kind of mama. And so what his mom did one time, she grabbed the Dawn dishwashing liquid. And she said, come over here. And she squirted it in his mouth. And he had a mouthful. And he thought he was just going to spite her, you know. And so he just looks at her and swallows it. Yeah, well, well, the thing you ought to know about Don dishwashing liquid is a mild laxative. And so <laughs> that dude, two things happen. One, he, he, he never used that phrase again in the house. And two, he just always obeyed his mom after that. And I don't necessarily recommend those things, but, but that's kind of how we think about this command, isn't it? Don't use the Lord's name in vain. So, so we shouldn't use foul language. Well, technically, this command is not the command for not using, you know, foul language. That would be Ephesians 4.29. Don't, don't let any unwholesome thing come out of your mouth. This command is much bigger than that. In fact, when you dive into the third command, don't take God's name in vain, you realize there's so much more going on that God has for us here. When you look at the Hebrew and you kind of unpack what this actually says in the Hebrew language, you, you, you discover this. This is how the command reads in Hebrew. Do not lift up God's name in a worthless manner. Let us settle in. Do not lift up God's name in a worthless manner. Now, when you start thinking about the command with those words, with that idea of lifting up God's name in a worthless manner, you realize that that covers an awful lot. There's an awful lot of things that you can, you can do that, that kind of lifts up God's name in a worthless commander, now, in a worthless manner. Now, the obvious one is just kind of just out there. It's, it's using God's name in a curse. You know, you've heard people just, just lay something down, and you're like, oh my gosh, they just said that, and they said it with God's name. They're frustrated at a person, place, uh, a situation, or a circumstance, and, and out of madness or frustration or an exclamation, they have just... They just have dumped God's name out there. And and that's obvious. God says, don't use my name that way. I don't use your name that way. When one of the angels messes up, I don't go, Jim. You know, I don't do that. So don't don't use my name that way. And God challenges us with that. He says, don't use my name in a worthless manner. But there's more here that I think actually captures us. And and I think here's where this this, um, command really gets challenging. 
Do you realize that you can use God's name in a worthless manner when your words about God, all your words about God, good words, all those things, your words about God don't match your actions toward God? Think about that. When your words about God don't match your actions toward God. So I think all of us at some point in our life have said, you know what, God is worthy to be praised. We can stand here and just say, man, yeah, God, we, we should be praising God. And we use those words and, and we tell people, yeah, God is worthy of praise. But then we don't praise him. We don't worship. We don't engage. We don't, we don't say praises back to God. That is having words that don't match your actions. And that's lifting up God's name in a worthless way. You have just said, I, I get what I say, but my actions are saying something completely different. Or, or maybe it's uh, the moment when we said, you know, God is trustworthy. God is so trustworthy. You can trust God. Maybe you've told your friends or neighbors or someone that sometimes God is so trustworthy, you can trust him. But your actions say something different. You, you're holding on to things and, and you're not trusting and, and, and you're not turning loose of circumstances or situations in your life. When you do that, when your words are saying one thing about God, but, but your actions are saying another, then you're lifting up God's name in a worthless manner. Uh, another way that, that happens, I think, to all of us is, you know, that moment when we simply say, I surrender to God. Sometimes we even sing the song, I surrender all. And when I sing that, sometimes I go, okay, do I really, really mean this? When we say that, I surrender all, God, I surrender to you. And yet we have those things that we hold on to. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping this. I'm surrendering everything. But technically, this one's mine, you know, whether it's, it's my relationships or whether it's uh, this hurt or this pain or this, this thing that I'm not going to give someone forgiveness on. And when we do that, when we say these words to God, but when our actions show something else, then the world sees that our God really is kind of worthless. He, he's worth talking about, but he's not worth us following and so when you see this command, when you see God simply saying, hey, listen, don't, don't lift up my name in a worthless manner. It, it actually is us saying, live a life that reflects the words we say about God in our actions. And I think that's a real big challenge for me personally. I know it. Jesus pushes into that. When you read the New Testament, when you go to the New Testament and you see what Jesus is doing, he often challenges very religious people. He challenges them. He pushes into them and simply says, listen, you're, you honor me with your lips and with your words, but your heart is far from me. And he presses into that. He sinners, he loves and he gives forgiveness. He pushes them to say, hey, go and sin no more. The, those who are seeking Christ and really trying hard, he embraces and he says, listen, keep going on and keep following me. But, but people that speak a lot of words toward God, but their actions don't reflect those words, he pushes back and he simply says, listen, you, you got to get this. You're lifting up my name in vain. You are calling yourself a Christian, which means Christ-like. But you, you don't look anything like Christ and you're not following me. And, and when I hear that, I, I get this command in a different, a different way. As Christ followers, when our actions don't match our words, then, then we are lifting up God's name in a worthless way. I feel this. Let me tell you, as I was thinking through this, I felt this as a pastor because Sunday in and Sunday out, I get up here and I teach. I teach you things about God, and we talk about things about God. We, we talk about these different truths, how he's faithful and those kind of things. And, and one of the biggest fears that I have, that after teaching you guys on a Sunday morning, I go home and I'm hanging with the kids, and let's say we talked about love. Hey, listen, we need to, we need to love God, you know, da, 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 and we need to love people. And I go home, and, and I'm not loving my family and then my kids grow up and look at me and say, yeah, Dad, you know, he, he really knew how to talk on Sunday, but he did not live the truth of his life. And that's me doing two things. One, it's being a hypocrite. But two, it's me not lifting up God's name in, in a way that's worthy. And I feel the weight of that. I want my words and my actions to match. Now, and I want you to hear something really important. This is not about perfection. God is not looking for perfection from you in these commandments. That's not what he desires. You, you shouldn't be at a place, if you are at a place where you're practicing everything you know about God 100%, write a book, I'll buy it. I want to know how to do that. 
It's not about perfection here. These Ten Commandments aren't a, a, a standard that we have to live up to, and, and if we don't, then we're just a failure. These commandments, and especially this commandment, is about pursuit. The truths that you know about God, how well are you pursuing them? Is God trustworthy? How well are you pursuing that? Have you surrendered to God? Have you said that? How well are you pursuing that? That God is faithful, that God is just, that God calls us to be generous people. How, how well are we pursuing the truths that we know? If you feel challenged here and, and you're thinking, man, that, there's quite a few that, that I don't. I know a lot of things about God, but my life doesn't really reflect it. And I encourage you to do this. Pick one. This week, pick one area. Maybe it's prayer. Maybe you simply say, I know I'm supposed to pray, and I tell people, pray and talk to God, but I don't really pray and talk to God. Pick that. And this week, pick a truth about Christ, pick a truth about God, and follow it and embrace it. And and see where he leads you and see how you can engage in this command of lifting up God's name in a worthy manner. Because this is what that command really is all about. Now, in talking about the name of God, as I was studying through this, I came across something that I really, really enjoyed, and it kind of encouraged me. Uh, Nowadays, names really, you know, they're special and unique, but but they're just kind of somewhat average. And I'm not saying your name is average. I'm just saying that we we just use them more to separate people. So we have we have Frank, and we have John, and we have Sue, and we have Sally, and and we kind of name people so we can separate them. So I don't have to say yo bro to everybody you know names are more for separation and when i was younger uh, actually when i was born which would be really younger uh my mom wanted to name me michael ray that's who i was supposed to be so shout out to all you michaels out there but she was out she was totally out and my dad came in the room signing the papers and he said nope that's he's not a michael ray he's a philip james Um, and so names are just kind of a way to signify who we are in the old testament it wasn't that way in the ancient uh, Middle East, names were very, very uh, critical, and they were significant because names defined character, and they defined nature uh, of a person or something that was going on. You have Abram, who was a guy that his name just means good father, and when he encounters God, God simply says, Abraham, I've got a, Abram, I've got a promise for you. You're going to be the father of many nations, and so he changes his name from Abram to Abraham which means father of a multitude. He carried that promise in his name and it signified his character and his nature and his destiny that God had for him. Jacob, you know the story of Jacob in the Old Testament. He was called supplanter or or trickster and and he tricked his brother out of his inheritance and, and eventually through his life he had a moment where he encountered God and God simply said, hey listen, I am changing your name. You are no longer Jacob, supplanter, trickster. That doesn't define you. You are Israel which means he who wrestles with God. Because Jacob had a moment when he saw God and he wrestled with God and he said, God, I need something from you. And God changed his name. So names were significant. So keep that in your mind when when I tell you this story. A couple of chapters previous in the book of Exodus, before the Ten Commandments, Moses Moses is, is kind of hanging out in the wilderness. He's been there. He's, he's left Egypt. This is pre-God's call to him to go lead the people out and, and everything. And he's hanging out. And he's, he's got his sheep, and he's been there for about 40-some-odd years. And he sees this bush that's burning. It's called the burning bush. And, and he walks up to it, and he's amazed because this thing is still on fire. And he's like, oh, my gosh, this is the desert. This should burn up. Uh, someone needs insurance. This is dangerous. And, and so he's standing there, and God shows up. And God says, Moses, you're on holy ground. Take off your sandals. And so he pops off his shoes and he says, God, who are you? What, what do you want? And God begins to speak with him about his plan and his purpose. I want you to go and, and bring the slaves out of Egypt. I, I'm going to make you a leader. And Moses asks something. He simply says this. He says, who are you? Big deal. Who are you to this, to this voice, this burning bush, this, this essence of God? And God gives him a name. He says, listen, I am Yahweh. I am that I am. And the name of God in that moment defined his character and defined his nature, defined who he was. We could spend weeks talking about that name, what that name means, but, but it's simply in, in just a small form. It means the God that has no beginning, the God that has no end, the God that is and all existence is in him. So you can imagine, I mean, it's, that's, that's bigger than Jim. You can imagine Moses standing there and, and him just saying, I am that I am, and the weight and everything that Moses felt just in hearing the name of God, the power that was there. 
And so for a thousand years, you have people worshiping God as Yahweh. I am that I am. Jesus shows up on the scene. And Jesus comes to the picture, and some disciples are asking him, hey, listen, how do we pray? They had that question. They were folks that wanted to know how to connect with God. And, and so Jesus says in Matthew 6, 9, he says, I want you to pray like this. And he does something amazing. You know how this prayer starts? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus, for the first time in a thousand years, takes the name of God and, and he simply says, I'm going to give you a different picture of the essence and nature and character of God. It is still Yahweh, the I am that I am, but now it is also Father our Father which art in heaven. And you have Jesus opening up to us in a very significant way uh, so much more about who God is. You don't have to know him as that God that's in the distance. He's way out there. Yahweh becomes Father. And he says that's a way that you can know God in personal relationship. It tells us that even as a good father that, that God wants to be known, he wants to be discovered, he wants to be pursued. And he's not given us these Ten Commandments as, as a bunch of rules just to go live your life how you want to try to figure it out and live it. He's, he simply says, I want to be discovered in this. I want, I want to give you ways to discover my heart. Call me Father. And for many of us, that's, that is a big deal to know that we can call the God of the universe Daddy. And how powerful that is and how important that is and and, and my simple encouragement to you is, is this. Don't waste your life not knowing God as your Father. If you're here this morning and, and you, you don't know what it means to have God as Dad, you don't know what it means to, to crawl up in your, your spiritual Father's lap and simply say, God, I need you, I want you, I, ne- I need you to minister to my heart, my relationships, then you are missing something amazing. Here's what, here's what 1 John, uh, this is chapter uh, 1, verse 12 says. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He becomes their father. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but children born of God. And so I love this. I love this picture of God being father. So this whole command, live a life that's worthy of the name of God, is very valuable to me. God is father. God is God is Yahweh, but me living a life where my actions reflect who he is as both Father and Yahweh. So that's a very powerful truth to me about this command. Well, let me turn uh, kind of a, a page here. We know God is Father. Our Father cares about something. He cares about truth. In fact, here's a few scriptures for you. We, we could spend a lot of time here too this morning. Let me give the, the uh, scriptures on truth. I did not write them down or memorize them. Here you go. Uh, Here's a couple of things about truth that God is passionate about. You can see he's passionate about truth in his word. Uh, For the word of God is right and all of his works are done in truth. John 17, 17. He sanctifies them. That would be us through truth. Thy word is truth. When you read the Bible, you realize that God, as a father, cares about truth. So it should be no surprise that, that the ninth commandment is a commandment about truth. And and this is what it simply says. It's this command right here, that you should not give false testimony against your neighbor. So that's the ninth command. We've covered the third. Here's the ninth. Don't give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, of course, you kind of pick this up. This is, the, this is something that you find more in a court of law. So is God really just interested in me being honest when it comes to court? Is that what God wants? I would encourage you with this, that God wants more than just honesty in court. He's not interested in, in the moment that you have to go and you have to testify against your neighbor and says, hey, be honest there, but everywhere else in life you don't have to be. In fact, Colossians uh, chapter 3 verse 9 gives us a, a good picture of, of how God wants us to be honest in our words, and it simply says this, 3, 9. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self which is being renewed in the, in the image in, in Christ and who he is. And so simply know this, the broader application of this verse, don't give false testimony against your neighbor, is simply this, don't lie. Be people of truth. Now, we can all get that, and we can all probably shake our heads yes, as moms and dads would go, yeah, I I teach my kids this all the time, I need to practice this. Most of us believe that we shouldn't lie. Now, here's an interesting statistic. 
80% of the people will admit that they do lie when the circumstances are right. So even though we all say we shouldn't lie, 80% of folks will admit that means there's a whole lot more, probably 99.9% of us, uh, who actually lie when the circumstances are, are just right for that. So just to help bring this commandment home, let me reflect on what some of those circumstances may be. See if you recognize any of these places where you might be tempted to say something that's not true. Fabrication. That's one way that we can tell a lie. You, you're late to work, and uh, your boss comes up and simply says, hey, you're late, what's, what's up? And, and you're in the moment, and you know you just overslept. You know, you know that's the truth. But here, you're, you're thinking about this, and you go, you know, there was a, there's a traffic pileup on 101. I mean, it was a 20-car pileup, and, and these cars were on fire. And so I was in the other lane, but I stopped, and I ran out, and, and I saved like 12 people. But in that, my clothes smelled like smoke, and I didn't feel like you wanted me to come to work in that condition. So I went home, took a shower, and I rushed back. And, and here I am, and that's why I'm five minutes late for work. It's uh, just really, you know, what happened. And, and we've all been there when we face the, uh, this idea that, man, I'm just, I'm just going to make something up in this moment, and it's fabrication. And what God says about that, even though it may help you in the moment, God says, be a people who speak truth. Don't lie. Be willing to face the consequences. I was five minutes late. I overslept. My, my wife should have woke me up. You know, be a person who, who is willing to dive in and simply be a person of truth and not fabricate things. So, so maybe you're not a fabricator. Maybe you say, no, Jim, I never make anything up. That would be a lie. But still, I never make anything up. So maybe this next one is probably a little, for me, a little bit for you. Have you ever uh, been caught up in denial? Let me give you a good example. Hey, did you get that email I sent you? And you know where that email is. It's sitting right on your screen. You didn't click it because you don't really like them. They never say anything good. It's the string prayer email. And you say, no, I didn't. It, uh, it, it didn't. I didn't get it. You want to resend that? You want to resend that email to me? And I'll make sure that I check it this time. It's that moment when we're faced with a circumstance and we know what the truth is and, and we know if we wait into it, we're going to have to own up to something. So we just deny that it happened. I I wasn't there. I didn't do that. Little kids do this all the time. My son, hey, are, did, did you eat the piece of chocolate? And like chocolate is all over his face and it's dripping out of his mouth. And he will look me in the eye and say, no. And I'm like, dude, dude, you're, you're, you're like your, your grandparents. What's going on? Uh, I'm to- totally picking. We have great grandparents. Um, anyway, so that whole denial thing, you've been in that place where, where, where you've wrestled with that, and, and God says, be careful, it's a, it's, it's a lie. Don't be a people that, that do that. Another one that, uh, that we kind of catch ourselves in, and this one's an intriguing one to us, it's, uh, it's spin, half-truth. You know, you're, you're doing that thing, maybe you're filling out your resume, and you're thinking, you know, i got to Man, this job market is tough, and so let me just pad this resume a little bit so you write down, yes, I'm, I'm the manager of a small business. I have a vice president and three very challenging employees. When the truth is, your dad, who's just married to a wife, and you got three crazy kids, uh, but you just put that on there where, where you spin the truth a little bit. And, and this one is real. This one is real. I think we challenge ourselves with this one a little bit. When we get in those circumstances, when we know the way to say words, to make ourselves look good and the other person not look as great. When you recount the story, when you retell the story to your friends about, about how that date went, I, we, we could probably talk about a moment with you and your wife, and, I, and it, maybe it was a tough moment, and I'd ask the husband the story, and this happens all the time as counseling. It's awesome. So, hey, you tell me your side. What happened? And they, they unpack the thing, and then she's sitting there, and then the eye roll, and then the head turn. And once he's done with his story, she just simply says, that is not how that happened. And then she unpacks the story, and it just kind of unfolds. And, and what are we doing? We're spinning. We're, we're taking truth, but we're shading it to make ourselves look better. And God says, that is a lie. And we're not called to be people who speak those kind of lies. We're supposed to be people that don't speak half-truths. We speak full truth. Here's another one I think is actually really relevant as, to us today, even in the Steubenville situation that's gone on up there. Did you know that silence is a way of lying? Keeping silent when you know truth. Uh, you know that you should say something to defend, but you don't. Let me read you a verse that you might not know. This is Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1. Memorize it. It simply says this. This is God speaking to his people. 
If a person sins because he does not speak up when he hears a public charge to testify regarding something he has seen or learned, he will be held responsible. I think that's a big thing for us because God does not call us to be a passive people. God does not call us to be a people that simply sees the wrongs of the world and we sit by and go, you know what, that's going to take too much effort, too much energy, I I don't want to wait in, so I'm just going to remain silent. So many atrocities have happened in this world from slavery to the Crusades to all these things because people have decided to stay silent. And God says, I'm not calling you to be a people of silence, I'm calling you to be a people of truth. And he calls us to speak and to stand up and and to be those people that bring truth and love to those around. So silence is a way and a form that sometimes we embrace the lie or we allow the lie to exist out there. There's there's another way that uh, we might find ourselves uh, kind of tangled up in this commandment. It's simply this assumption. Have you ever done this? When someone walks in and, and maybe they, they don't dress like you, they don't look like you, they got a few more tattoos than you do, and you make these assumptions about who they are. Oh, that, I, I think that's a gang member. Don't go talk to them unless you need to purchase something. I just don't do that. And, you, and so you carry these, these images and ideas in your mind, and what happens is, whether you, whether you know it or not, you, you act on those. You keep the children here. You kind of, you're, you're acting on those assumptions and those things you hear, and it could, be, it could be anything like that, but you're believing things that are unproven, and you're believing things that probably are untrue. And the moment you put voice to those things to someone else, did you just... It becomes slander and gossip. And so the heart of slander and gossip in in the very core is us making assumptions about people and things that we shouldn't without wading in and finding out story and history. Some of the the best stories we have here at First Christian are, are about people that don't quite look like us, but who have found Christ and who are amazing in their heart and their journey and would blow you away with how they've experienced transformation. And so God says... Don't assume, don't assume, wait in, find story, who they are. And, and the last one I'll simply mention is, is this one right here. It's, uh, it's exaggeration. And, and invariably different people struggle with this. I think this is kind of the sin for pastors. Someone's probably going to ask me this week, hey, how many people are in church this Sunday? And I'll go, you know, I didn't count, but it felt like 7,000. Uh, I'm bad with numbers. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's that exaggeration. It's that moment when you know what the truth is, and you know exactly how it went, but you add to the story. Fishermen struggle with this, you know. Uh, d- uh, people that, that do other things struggle with it. It's, it's that moment when we simply say more than what the truth is. Now, these are all funny ways to kind of look at, at how we use our words and, and what, what those things do. But here's what I've realized having just looked through this list. I have broken probably almost all of those. I know I've fabricated, I've denied, I've spun, there's been silence, there's been assumptions, there's been exaggeration. And so a command that I think I'm pretty good at, you know, no false witness against my neighbor and my neighbors, everyone, I realize at the heart of that command, I've broken it pretty badly. And I have to step up and go, God, I'm sorry. I need to be a man of truth. You need to be men of truth. You need to be women of truth who speak words uh, in truth. And and we have a God that is a God of truth. And he's given us a spirit of truth. And we're called to be a people of truth. That we pursue truth not only in just our words, but we pursue truth in our actions. And this is why I think the commandment number nine is tied to commandment number three and why I put them together together. Because when you worship God in a way that's worthy, your actions match your words, and that is truth. There's no hypocrisy in your life, and and there's none of these pieces that are like, I say this, but I do this. And and people just see you as a true person, a person that's genuine, a person that's real. And that is what God calls us to. Church is not a place where we put on our happy face. We put on our, our good clothes and, and, and just our Jesus smiles. And, and we're, we're those people when on the inside we're torn up and we're messed up and we're struggling. Church is a place where we are real. 
real with each other. Now we can't all dump our stuff out right here because then you'd be talking and I'm supposed to be the one talking this morning. And so it is, we can't do it here in this moment, but, but we need to find those people and those groups and those communities where we can be real with each other. That's what church really is. Meeting folks where they are and then walking them to Jesus. And that means we need to be a people of truth living the spirit of truth in our heart and our life. And that's what God is calling us to. That's what these commandments are all about and, and where we're going as is, is being a people of truth. Now, I'll just simply end with this. It's a word of encouragement about truth. And it's Ephesians 4.15. You might know this. It simply says this, because as I challenge you to speak truth, here's what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to go home, and uh, you're going to have a moment when your wife or your spouse or your husband ask you something and it's, yeah, how do I look in this dress? You know, what, what do I do over here? What, and you're going to have a moment to say truth. Here's what I discover about people who pursue truth. When you start getting truth down, you start speaking truth, it can become a club. Do you know those people that, that speak truth, but they kill you with it? They typically have the biggest Bible, and they take it. They don't read it to you. They just smack you over the head with it. This is truth, and you will get it or die. And they just beat you with truth. The scripture has a powerful word about that. It simply says this, Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in what? Love. The point of truth isn't that you win the argument. I get that. The point of truth isn't that you win the argument. The point of truth is that you introduce people, you bring people to transformation. And that may be that you walk with them in love and grace and you give them a little truth and you go, let's just journey with that. And, and then they react and you give them a little bit more truth and let's just journey with that. And you, you are leading people in truth to God. And Jesus says at the end of the day, it's not about you winning the fight. It's about you winning the heart with truth and transformation and bringing that in love. So if you're a person that gets truth, you love truth, and you speak truth, I don't use it as a club. Use it as a transformation tool that you're able to speak around you. So speak the truth in love. It's, it's all about us meeting people where we're at. So let us be people that lift up, lift up God's name in a worthy way, and let us be people of truth. Can we do that with these Ten Commandments? I'm going to pray for us and ask God to seal these things to our hearts this morning. Father, we have talked about lifting up your name in, in a way that's worthy. And we're about to enter a moment of, of praise. We're about to enter a moment of communion. And so hear our words. You are worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our praise. And, and help us to act on that. Let our actions reflect praise and worship this morning, Father. Let us be people of truth. And that may mean that we are honest with you, may that we're honest with you, God, that, that maybe for the first time we admit that we have faults and failures to you, God, and we simply are true to you about ourselves, and we can say that we need you. I know I do. I need you, Father, and in truth, I'm saying that right now. I need you in my life for transformation. Let us be a people that speak truth to you, and then just honor our, our tongues and our mouths that we be people that speak truth to those around us, for the very purpose of transformation and that all of us have conversations that are powerful and real with our friends and our family and strangers this week that are just overflowing with truth and love and grace and that you engage us in, in conversations of transformation. We love you, Father, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.